We are studying together as a congregation for a number of weeks yet until at least uh, almost to the end of the year. This prophet and prophecy from Jeremiah, some of you have called him Jerry from time to time, and that's okay because that's probably what he would have been called today. And I'm finding out that a lot of us uh, are not real familiar with the book of Jeremiah. I hear comments uh, already like, I never knew that was in the Bible. I never knew that was in the Bible. I never knew that was in the Bible. So how do you think we know that that was in the Bible? You got to read it, right? I hope, I'm hoping you're reading through the book of Jeremiah. There's a lot of stuff in there. We're not going to get through all of it. We're going to get through mainly the, these, these beginning chapters and then odds and ends throughout. But there's this common message of hope for the hopeless. Most of us feel like and know what it's like to feel hopeless. And some of us right now are at a place in our lives where we're feeling more hopeless than others. You've got to sit through this series and listen how God deals with hopeless people. Because sometimes that hopelessness is a condition you're experiencing because of what you've been doing in your life. And there's this thing called consequences to ungodly living. Hope for the hopeless. Our text is going to be from Jeremiah 6, verse 16. And I'm going to be reading with you verses 16 through 21 at this time. If you'd like to follow along in the Bible in the chair in front of you, it's found on page 11. 48, page 1148, write a section where, where God is, is letting Judah, his, his called chosen people, know you're in a bad place and living in a bad way. And I've got to tell you, if you don't change the way you're living, you're going to have some big, serious consequences. Like the city that you live in and the temple that you worship me in, it's going to be destroyed. Because your righteousness matters much more to me than your religion. Think about it. God isn't nearly as concerned about your religion as he is about your righteousness. Jeremiah 6, verses 16 through 21. As often we hear in prophetic language, this is the word of the Lord, or this is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. I appointed watchmen over you and said, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But you said, we will not listen. Therefore, hear you nations, you who are witnesses, observe what will happen to them. Hear you earth, I am bringing disaster on this people the fruit of their schemes, because they have not listened to my words and have rejected my law. What do I care about incest from Sheba? Now, this chapter and the next chapter, God's going to be talking about how faithful you are in worship, kind of like what we're doing this morning. How faithful you are. You're, you're worshiping me every week. And now he's going to say here and, the, and next week, the Lord willing, I couldn't care less about your worship if, if your life is not righteous. What, what do I care about your incense from Sheba and the sweet columnists from a distant land? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable. Your sacrifices, they do not please me. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I will put obstacles before this people. Parents and children alike will stumble over them. Neighbors and friends will perish. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Thanks be to God. Going back to verse, uh, uh, chapter 6, verse 16, uh, this, this text this morning, I just want to focus on this one verse, and uh, I trust uh, God has a word for me and for all of us this morning as we seek to understand this verse. Stand at the crossroads and look. What, what does it mean when, when we hear these words, whether it's in biblical times or in our times, when you hear the phrase, at the crossroads, or when we speak of crossroads. Usually it has to deal with sometimes literally standing at a road where there's a crossroads or a fork. Or, or it has to do with, as in this case, you're looking for a direction to go in your life. And you're standing at a place in your life where you've got to make a decision. What's going to be your next step? What path are you going to take? 
Are you going to stay on the path that you're on, which I trust, as for those of us who are Christians, is a good path, or if you're on not a good path right now in your life, and you know because God has made it clear through his spirit in you that something that you're doing is not a very good or righteous thing, or are you going to make a decision to go on the not-so-good path because the grass looks greener on the other side of the fence? Standing at the crossroads calls for a directional decision. For example, how many of you know where this is, this sign? Can you read it? I'm going south. I'm 40. Where, where do you think I was headed when I took this picture? Yeah, Turkey Run. Thank you. I wouldn't have known that two weeks ago. 41, I, I, here I am. My wife is sleeping because she likes to kind of rest while I'm driving. And you know what I did this time for those of you who are weeks ago, those two ladies that always talk in my car when I move, I left them home. You can, if you don't know what that means, you can talk to me after the service. I had two different uh, GPS women chatting along when I went to a hospital some time ago, and they both took me in a different direction, right? So they're not in my car anymore now. And if somebody told me, you just follow 41 South. It'll take you right to Turkey Run. So I'm driving along, you know, nice and quiet. These ladies aren't chatting, run to sleep. And then I come to this kind of this, this fork in the road at the crossroads here. And it says, and I'm thinking, well, they said 41 South, but no, for some reason I saw 41 on that sign and South on the other one, 63. So I just kept right on a going, down 63. <laughs> and you know, does anybody else have this? You, you, all of a sudden, you, when you're going in the wrong direction, you have a sense that you're going in the wrong direction. And the reason I really sense that because I, had my, I still had my phone on and all of a sudden when, it, when I was here and it said like 35 miles to Turkey Run, all of a sudden it was 40 miles to Turkey Run, then 45 miles to Turkey Run. And I'm scratching my head thinking, something's not right. And it wasn't. In fact, it took me 40, 40 more minutes to get back to Turkey Run. Now, what I should have done, what do you think I should have done when I came to this place in the road where I had to make a decision? I'm not going to wake her up, no. <laughs> but I probably should have, right? The smart thing to do would either be to stop, take my phone, and ask one of those ladies who follow me anyway, even though they don't talk, how do I get to Turkey Run? Or to ask Brenda, Stop. I got to stop and I got to look and I got to ask for directions because I don't think I'm quite going the right way. When you talk about a crossroad, you're talking about a, a direction that you're going in and you have to decide when you come to a fork in the road, which way am I going to go? We find in this passage that Judah is at the crossroads. They're on a certain path and, and God sends Jeremiah and he says, listen, Judah, I need you to do something. I know you're going down a road that you're headed on. It might be the path of obedience, but I dare say it's not. It probably is the path of disobedience. I need you to stop for a moment in your living. Even stop in your worship of me, which you do very well, by the way. But he says, that's not a big deal to God if you're not living out and how you're worshiping. He says, I need you to stop. I need you to stand. I need you to look. And I need you to consider what path you are on. And Jeremiah from God says to them, listen, because if I'm not mistaken, the path you're on is the wrong path. It is a path of disobedience. Do you know that you're on the path of disobedience? Because I think you're blind to the fact that you are. Read through Jeremiah 5. Read through Jeremiah 6. There's a reason we heard the, 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 the Ten Commandments this morning. Because God through Jeremiah points out that Judah was breaking every single one of those Ten Commandments. Every single one. If you can believe it, you say, wait a second, murder too? Oh yeah. They were also worshiping this God called Molech. And what did they do in how, in how they worshiped the God of Molech like the nations? Do you remember what they did to their children? They sacrificed them. <laughs> can you believe it? Children of God, God's chosen people, have gone so far over the deep end, down the path of disobedience, that they were even sacrificing their children as a sacrifice to God, this God of Molech, and even thinking that their God, our God, was a God who would be pleased with this. 
This morning, first of all, God calls all of us just to stand for a moment, but don't stand up literally. Stand and look. Take a moment to sit back and reflect. Where are you walking? How is your walk with God? And are you walking with God? Are you on the path of obedience or disobedience? Because it's very important, and we all have to do this when we're retrospective in this way. This is why meditation and reflection, so we don't just read Scripture, then meditate on it. Maybe God is, is, is showing up here this morning to say something to all of us, and that, listen, could it be that you're on the path of disobedience? Is there something that, that God through the Holy Spirit has been pressing on you or on your heart that needs to change? Something in your life which you know is not the right path, but you've been on it so long that you even come to the point where you think that it's okay, God's not so bothered by it. When I began thinking about this, uh, I began thinking about a, a number of things that this generation has, has decided that it's okay to do that my generation and generations past didn't think it was a very good idea to do. In fact, it was a path of disobedience. My heart still bleeds when I hear, as we have here as well, some of our own children who decide that it's okay to move in with their boyfriend or girlfriend. You don't have to marry. Everybody's doing it. Well, could be that everybody is doing it. But do you think God is pleased when, when our children, and if you're one of them, make a decision as they walk on the, their path or their walk with God to say, I think it's okay to live with someone before I marry. I'm, I think it's okay to have sex with someone before I'm married. I think it's okay that I can even have children before I'm married. How things have gotten, gotten kind of backwards as we walk with God in obedience. This is going on more and more in this generation. Or when it comes even with a whole issue of theology and, and doctrine and, and even talking about now, which is, seems to be before us all the time, same-sex marriage. There was a day that we didn't even talk about it. It, it, it was just, you know, verboten, I think, is that, if that's the wrong word, I think that's the right word. It's something you didn't do or, or accept. And why is it now that when I read, even in Christianity Today and other magazines, that a number of, quote, so-called Christians have stepped over the fence and decided, because of their, of their emotional bent, not theological truth bent, their emotions now have gotten a better side of them, and either because they have a relative or the like who is, is going in that direction, they've decided that now it's okay. And they believe that God honors and blesses same-sex marriages. It could be our greed. It could be our self-centeredness. It could be that in all of us, think about it, and may God convict each one of us this morning, there's something in this moral compass that we have, that you have, which you know is not right. And yet we make a choice to walk in that direction. Off the path of obedience, on the path of disobedience. This morning God comes to us in grace as he always does when we find ourselves off the beaten path. God always comes in grace. And he says, listen, let me talk to you about the ancient paths. That's something we've got to remember, something we have to get back into our system. He says, through Jeremiah, let me talk about the ancient past. Now, an ancient path is something, a path that has been tried and true. It is well trodden. It is a path that, that people of God have been walking on through the centuries. It's that kind of path. Now, I began thinking about um, well trodden paths and, and paths of long ago. And I came up with any number of paths that are really old, old paths. It's not that one. This is one of the paths. This is, does anybody know part of the, you wouldn't know just by looking at this path. The Appalachian Trail. It's been around for a long time. Anybody ever walk any part of it here this morning? We got a free cookie for you afterwards. You have. What, the whole way? No. Wow. And how about this one? Anybody ever get on your motorcycle and say, let's take Route 66 out west? Yes, never been on it. Is there really, is, is this actually on the road or is that somebody just put that on this pick? Is there a sign that actually says Route 66 on the road? Anybody know? Either way, this is an old path that used to take you west and then of course back. Then there's this path. This is called, I'm going to get it right, 
the Kumano Kodo path in Japan, a very, very ancient and old path that people still take. And then one of the oldest paths uh, that I am told, at least from my research, is this path in the UK. It's called the Ridgeway Pathway. And generations from long, long ago have taken this path, and now people today still take it as well. The ancient path that Jeremiah is referring to. Now, Irv, could you give me that pic back of the path of obedience, please? The path of obedience. The ancient path that Jeremiah is speaking of is the path of obedience. Well, think about it for a moment. The ancient path of obedience. What God, I believe, is trying to bring through Jeremiah to Judah's mind is, he says, let's step back in your history, can we? He says, let's go way back to those who've walked on the ancient path. So surely they would begin to have to think about things like people who walked on this path would be people like Abraham, Moses, Joshua, Caleb, people like Deborah, Ruth, people like Elijah, people like Elisha, people like Jeremiah the prophet other prophets that brought the word of the Lord to people. He says, let's talk about the ancient paths, the path of long ago, and those who walked on this path, all of them which would lead to the line of Judah through whom Christ would come. He said, these men and women walked on the path of obedience. Did that mean they were perfectly obedient in every way all the time? No. There, there was no one righteous. So I think the next chapter or the chapter for that talks about that. There was no one who righteous, but at least their desire and, and their way of life was to live in obedience. All of these people who walked the path of obedience because they wanted to walk with God. Who's the man who walked with God and God took him because, he, who is that? Enoch, right? This man walked with God so closely that God says, I'm going to take you to myself now. Wow. The path of obedience. For us, it was a path taken by our forefathers and our foremothers. Think about it. From generations past, some of us are believers and Christians today because of the path of obedience that was taken by our forefathers and mothers. Think about it right up to the day. Now, all of you haven't had this, this privilege and blessing that some of us has had to be brought up in a Christian home or that your grandparents or your great-grandparents and beyond that were brought up as believers. And think about and praise God for those in the near past or the way past, that because of their walk and their path of obedience, it was passed on to the next generation and to the next generation and now to this generation, and that many of us are walking with God today by the grace of God, yes, but because God has, has blessed you with, with parents and grandparents and the like in your past who walked on this path of obedience. Those who made a decision to follow Jesus Christ and to walk with him. A well-trodden path is this path of obedience. And many of us walk it. We praise God because of faithful, godly ancestors. God's word to Judah and God's word to us this morning is simply this. He says, listen, you are at the crossroads. Stop for a moment. Whatever path you're on, stop. Stand. Look where you're going. A decision needs to be made before you take one more step, even in leaving this place. A decision needs to be made what path you're going to be taking. If the path is a path of disobedience, as God is, if God is going to be convicting some of us this morning, which he will, if, if God is saying, listen, yeah, on the whole, you're doing pretty good, but there's some stuff in your life which shows me you're on the path of disobedience and you've just decided to stay in that path. He said, this is this morning I need your attention to stop, to stand, to look, consider what you're doing, you know it's the wrong path, and it's time to change your direction. To get back on the right path. The good path. The ancient path in walking with me. Choose the path of obedience. Notice he says in, in, in verse 16, and then walk in it. Walk in it in obedience. Did you know that obedience is a big deal to God? It's a big deal. 
worshiping like we, we are doing here this morning is a big deal to God. We're going to find out in Jeremiah 7 next week that God couldn't care less how you worship if you're not obedient to him. In fact, who's the other prophet? Amos is the one that says, Away with the noise of your songs! Away with your worship! Let righteousness flow on like a river. Did you know that? That God is much more concerned about your obedience than he is about your worship? Now, worship matters to him too. But if you're living in disobedience and going down the path of disobedience, don't, don't come here on Sundays and act as if everything's okay and that you're cool with God. That's not how it works. In fact, is it this chapter or the next? I've been studying both, so forgive me. Where God actually says of Judah, oh, J Jeremiah, tell them, don't even pray to me. I'm not listening to you anymore. Oh, don't even pray. You've got to understand that if you're on the path of disobedience, you are not in my will. If you walk on the path of obedience, and if you walk with me, notice in this verse where he says, then what? If you've been restless, if you've been weary, if things haven't been going good for you in your life, if your life has become a mess, guess what? If you come back and walk on the path of obedience, notice those words, you will find rest for your souls. Wow. You say, that's all it takes? It's, could, could that be why my life is so restless and such a mess right now? Because I've allowed myself to go down a path of disobedience and things aren't going right. Walk with God and you will find rest for your souls. In New Testament terms, we would speak about keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. Now, we read these Ten Commandments this morning, which, was, which is always a part of our past and our tradition. Sometimes people say, how come we don't read them every week? And one answer is, God has now given us the Holy Spirit. If you go to Galatians 5 and read about if you are a Christian and filled with God's Spirit, the Spirit is going to convict you and have you walk the path of obedience. Doesn't, doesn't it kind of get you in your head sometimes? You say, let's see, am I keeping all the commandments? Am I keeping not just those ten, but there are a principle, of course, for the hundreds of commands God gives us. He says, if you're walking in the Spirit of God with me, you will be keeping the commandments. Walk with the Spirit. Walk in obedience to the Spirit. And you won't have to worry if you broke one or two or six or all ten of them or more. Because the Spirit's going to guide you into all truth. The kind of righteousness that God is looking for from you. Now, you would think with such a message like this from Jeremiah, God's chosen people, uh, Judah, you would think that, that, that when he comes with such a powerful message and they're calling back to them to get back on track, get back on the road again, to get back on the right road, you would think that Judah would say, wow, convicted, guilty as charged. I'm changing my direction. But you know how this verse ends? Did you see that in verse 16? Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask at the ancient past. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. You will find rest for your souls. But you said what? Judah said, we will not walk in it. Remember from the earlier chapters? We love our lives with what we're doing too much to change. We just love it too much. We love going after other gods. Remember that phrase? In spite of the powerful message and the grace that God comes to their men, they said, we will not walk in it. And the result, and you read this earlier in chapter 6, these, these uh, beginning verses and the like, and these first several chapters in Jeremiah, God says, because you will not walk in it, guess what? The beautiful, beloved city and the temple where you worship me, it's going to be destroyed. There's going to be, I'm going to send a people who don't even know me, right? The Babylonians. I'm going to send them in, and they're going to tear apart Jerusalem with a sword. They're going to kill mothers, fathers, singles, teenagers, and children. They're going to burn down the temple because you people just don't understand how important it is to obey me and to walk with me. And there will be 70 years of exile. And then not only that, the next 400 years after that, that's called the intertestamentary period, for 400 years, since you do not want to hear the word of the Lord, you're not going to hear it. Right after, after who's the last prophet? Malachi? After Malachi, 400 years of silence. That's the whole Greco-Roman period beginning, and, and God is silent for 400 years. You think he's kind of angry at his people who didn't want to walk in obedience? Until, of course, who would the next prophet that would be that would come? New Testament, first one. 
He's not a reformer. He's a Baptist, right? <laughs> John the Baptist. God begins to speak to them again through the prophet. That's how Judah responded. What's as important this morning is to ask the question, how will you respond? You see, you just can't leave here this morning and hearing God's word and go back and live in any part of, on that path of disobedience that some of us, if not all of us, are walking on. Surely there's one point in your life which you are disobedient in, and don't just kind of look to the left or the right or in front of you or behind you. Just keep this on yourself. Is God going to convict you this morning through his spirit and through his word regarding that sin that's in your life and you've got to walk in obedience now? You've got to change directions. You can't go back and take the same road that you've been on. You're at the crossroads. You've got to stand, you've got to look, and you've got to consider and reconsider how you're going to walk. That in mind, with that in mind, Jesus comes really with two uh, words of instruction this morning. I'm trying to get to, oops, sorry. First of all, in Matthew 7, perfectly fitting into what God is telling us this morning. These verses from Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. Judas finding that out. And may many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. By God's grace, he's given us the grace at, to find it this morning. If you're on the path of disobedience, it's a broad path that most of the people in the world take. Guess what the end is of that path for you? It is destruction. Your life is not going to a very happy place. If you think it's bad now, it's going to get worse. If you choose to stay on the path of disobedience. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many find it, but a few by God's grace. And that means you, that means me this morning. And anyone who hears God's word of grace, a few find it. And they know because of Jesus Christ's perfect obedience, what he did in the cross and, and the power of the resurrection... He can give us the, the power, the, what we need to walk in the path of obedience. Praise God, there, there's, there's a few here this morning, could be all of us, those few who understand what it means to walk in the path of obedience. And, and maybe there's somebody sitting here this morning, maybe one of those children that aren't walking in the same path that mom and dad or grandpa or grandma was walking in. And believe it, it's heavy on the hearts of your parents and grandparents if that's you and you just happen to be here this morning. Uh, it, and maybe you're finding out, even though you thought the grass was greener on the other side of the fence, that you've been on this path now for some time. And, uh, boy, you're not getting blessed by it at all. And maybe you're even blind to the fact. And you're becoming weary or you're even becoming hopeless. And you're wondering... What's happening to my life and why are these things happening to me? And it could be that you, you've made just a bad decision on the road that you're on, the path that you've taken. And it's not everything that everybody said it was going to be and, and you find yourself in a really hopeless, hopeless condition and you're wondering what to do. With that, Jesus comes with an invitation. He says, listen, if that's you, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am weak and lowly of heart. And what? Oh, here he is quoting Jeremiah. You will find rest for your souls as well. Wow. Jesus knew his Bible. He knew the prophets. And maybe you've got to find that rest this morning. Maybe you've got to find that peace, a certain calmness in your life that, it, that you haven't had for a while because the path you have taken has been the wrong path. Jesus, again, and God, by grace, comes and he says, come to me, and I can give you the rest for your soul that you so badly need, and you can find that in me. All things considered, this is really what it's about. We're at the crossroads. Every day we're at the crossroads. Every morning you get up, you're standing at the fork in the road, and, and you're going down a certain path. And I trust for many here this morning the path of obedience. And what God is simply asking you to do this morning is to stand and to look at the crossroads. And as you leave here this morning, and as you continue your journey tomorrow, before taking one more step, you've got to make the right decision. What path am I going to take? And maybe mom and dad, grandpa and grandma, or generations past had it right, and I got it wrong. God is calling you. Jesus is calling you. The Holy Spirit is calling you. Ask for the ancient path the good way, the good way.
the right way, the path of obedience. Take this path, and you will find rest for your souls. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word. We thank you for prophecy. We thank you for, for the prophets who, by your grace, you've given us to read and to learn from, because we know redemptive history repeats itself time and time and time again. And we're part of that story. And sad to say, we're so much a part of that story that we too, at times, can be fickle people, fickle believers and Christians who make poor decisions at times because we too think the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. And then we start, start to go down a certain path or start to change our theology start to accept things that aren't really true, but we think they are, and start to live in a certain way that we really don't think is so bad, and yet they are. We pray this morning for children of this congregation, sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters who have yet to make a decision to follow the ancient path and this path of obedience, and whose walk right now is far away from you. We know how much you love your covenant children. And we know by your grace that your spirit can continue to work in their hearts as we pray for them to call them back to the ancient paths and the path of obedience and to walk in it. Because obedience is a big deal. And, and maybe, maybe, Father, uh, you're, you're at this very present time disturbing their lives in such a way that they're beginning to realize they've made some poor decisions. Open their heart by your grace. Open their minds. And by your grace, may they come back to Jesus and see the path that is clear and the path of obedience and that they can experience your blessing again. We, we pray for them. And, and even as we sit here as parents and grandparents this morning, we, we pray for them by name. By your grace, the loving, faithful God that you are. Call them back to the good way, to the ancient path, that they too may find rest for their souls. We pray all this in the name of Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit who continues to transform lives. Everyone say, amen. amen.